good morning. Good morning. Hey, it's good to see everybody. A couple quick things. Uh, number one, uh, our very own Corey Asbury, who is our, one of our worship pastors, uh, has a brand new CD that has just come out. Have you guys heard about this? Um, it's called Reckless Love. And uh, some of you already know this, but some of you may not. Corey, in addition to being our worship pastor here, is also uh, a Bethel worship artist. And uh, his song, Reckless Love, came out as a single not too long ago, and it did something uh, that no other song has ever done. Uh, Spotify live streaming the song, Reckless Love, for a, a time was the number one most streamed song in the world, <laughs> secular or a Christian. And so it's unheard of. So the guy who owns Spotify is like, who's Corey Asbury? So he like actually called to find out who the guy was. And so it's pretty amazing when you're like Selena Gomez, but Corey's above you. That's pretty awesome. Um, so his album just dropped on Friday. This is a big deal. Uh, there are so many amazing songs on this CD. Uh, and uh, it, it, I've been listening to it on repeat for the last two days. It's incredible. We have this in our bookstore, the CD. So uh, I would encourage everybody because it's family. Uh, number one, because you need these songs. They're just really life-giving. But number two, because we want to support Corey as well. Uh, if you, if you uh, have a CD player, grab this CD. We just have a limited number of them in the bookstore, so grab them. Uh, if you are like more progressive, download it on iTunes uh, if you are looking for a cassette tape of the album, you're just out of luck. Uh, they, <laughs> they just don't make those anymore. And uh, eight tracks, I, I don't even want to go there. So, so anyways, please grab one of these. This is mine right there, so you can't have it. Um, but please uh, grab a hold of that. And, and then also pray for Corey because this week uh, he's doing interviews on radio and different things like that. And so it's a real opportunity for him to express the message behind the entire CD, which is about the Father heart of God. It's just really, really uh, spirit-soaked and really rich. Uh, so I want you to know about that. And then Wednesday, everybody say Wednesday night. Wednesday. We're finishing up the fast, and uh, we're going to have a powerful time. I know John said something about it, but we have a guest who's going to be helping us lead worship. She's new to our house. Her name is Davy Flowers, and uh, she is an amazing, an amazing worship leader. She's going to be leading with our team, and then there's, uh, in addition to the worship, we're also going to have a time of ministry for healing and for deliverance, for prodigals. It's going to be really powerful. We want you to be here with us. And... Uh, that's going to be at 6.30 on Wednesday night. If you brought your Bibles this morning, open them with me to Romans chapter 12. This is part four of our series entitled Saints and Sinners. At the very beginning of this year, I, I said that I felt that the Holy Spirit had impressed on me that 2018, it was really on God's heart to help you and I more fully understand our identity in Christ who we are, what God has done in us, who he's made us to be. You know, we're probably never going to fully understand our identity in Christ. What really has happened because of the cross until we see him face to face. You know, the Bible gives us these promises. It says in, in 1 John, it says, when we see him, here's what we know. We know that when we see him, we shall be like him. Isn't that an amazing promise? That on that day when you see Jesus face to face, you will be like him. You will have been changed and transformed. That's an amazing promise. But I think on this side of eternity, it's very difficult sometimes for us to really comprehend and understand what our identity truly is in Christ, how things have changed, how drastic the change really is. And so that's what this series is about. Today we're going to be talking about the process of renewal of our minds, changing the way that we think. Because how many know that most of our life is shaped, decisions that we make, who, how we see ourselves, how we see other people, even how we see God is shaped by our thinking, whether it's true or false. Your, your thinking, your paradigms, your belief systems can be very real to you, but that doesn't mean that they're true. Isn't that true <laughs> right there? Hopefully that's true, because the Word of God actually says that. It says, so as a man 
thinks in his heart, so is he. So how we think about ourselves is how we actually live out our lives. So Romans chapter 12, verse 2, by the way, this is my life verse. I memorize, It was one of the very first scriptures I memorized, and it has been a foundation for my life. So look with me here at Romans 12, verse 2. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God for your life. The good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. I don't know about you, but that's what I want for my life. The good, the acceptable, the perfect. I want the will of God for my life. I want to live my life, and at the end of it, when I see him, when this world is folded up and put away like a, like a garment in a drawer, and I step into eternity and I see God, the one who knew me, caused me, created me, the one who has walked with me, the one who redeemed me, and the one who ultimately is going to resurrect me and give me eternal life. When I look him into the eyes, I want to know in that moment that I have fulfilled the purpose for which he created me. That's my goal. It's, my goal is not riches. My goal isn't possessions in this world. My goal really isn't even that people like me. It's better when people like you, but I can live without people liking me. I can live with disappointing people as long as I don't disappoint God. I want to live my life so that at the end of it, I haven't fulfilled other people's will for my life. I have actually fulfilled the maker of my life's will. That's what Paul's talking about, the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God for our lives. But notice how he says that we get there. He says that we have to go through a process of renewing of our minds. Therefore, that's why he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by, and here's where he says it, the renewing of your mind. In other words, the way that you position yourself to fulfill fill God's will and God's purpose for your life is to be renewed, changed, transformed in your thinking. Because conforming is a word, actually the word conform is used in a couple different places in the New Testament. It's used in Romans chapter 12 and it's also used in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 12 says, right, that we just read, says that the world wants to conform you. And whenever you read the, the scriptures, especially the New Testament, it talks about the world. It's talking about two different things. When John 3.16 says God so loved the world, he's talking about the people. And how many know that God loves people? God is in the people business. Raise your hand if you know that. You need to know that. Okay, but there's also a second use of the word world. Whenever you, in this particular case, it says do not be conformed to the world, it's talking about a system or a way of thinking. It's talking about a paradigm. It's talking about a philosophy, a grid that we've all been born into, educated, trained, and shaped by. And whenever you see that word conformed, it's a word that means a mold. If you've ever seen what tool and dye people do, or you know, people that uh, make like pottery or different things like this, you have a mold. And you pour, like in a tool and dye type of situation, you have a mold that you create that is precise so that you can make replicas. And then what you do is you melt down either your plastic or your precious metals and you liquefy it to where it's pliable and then you pour it into the mold and when it hardens, you make exact replicas according to the mold. When Paul says do not be conformed to the world, what he's saying is the world has a mold that it wants to put you into. It wants to make you a replica exactly like everybody else with the same results, the same way of life, the same perspectives, the same hang-ups, the same limitations. And the world doesn't want you to be different. The world doesn't want you to transcend. The world system wants to keep you as a slave, as a prisoner, and limited. And so it has a mold, and from the very beginnings of our life, we're poured into it so that we become shaped and conformed. But it says, in Christ... God's desire for our lives is that we would actually be transformed, changed. In other words, God wants to break the mold off of your life. See, 
If you just live according to the way of the world, you'll, you, if, you, if you're happy with that, if, if you want the results of this broken world, all you have to do is just live in this broken world, be trained by this broken world, and you will replicate this broken world in your inner world. There's a broken world out there. How many know that? Raise your hand if you know the world is broken. Can I tell you, the broken world out there is the result of broken worlds in here. God wants you and I to be transformed by the renewing, the changing, the renewing, making new our minds, our attitudes, our thoughts, the way that we live our lives so that, and then here's the result, so that we can prove out, that we can actually live out not the world's will, but God's will for our lives. That's a pretty good deal. When God says, hey, if you will allow me to change the way that you think, I can change your destiny. If you will allow me to reshape you, I can change the trajectory of your life. Well, how does renewal work? How many of you have ever watched one of these HGTV shows where they go into these houses that are just trashed out, mess or old, dilapidated, nobody else wants, it's been off the market for like 10 years, and they go in and they turn it into a beautiful, wide open floor plan. You guys ever watch these shows? Guys, raise your hands, because I know your wives make you watch them just like mine does. It's like, hey, baby, football's on. I want to watch Fixer Upper. Marriage credits, bam. It's like, hey, and by the way, I'm good with, like, watching one, but when it's, like, 48-hour marathon of it, I like chip gains, but come on, somebody. And I'm always amazed, though, when they go into this house, and they're just like, yeah, for about... You know, $50,000, we're going to redo the kitchen, we'll redo the floors, knock out these walls, we're going to decorate. I'm like, I can't buy doorknobs for $50,000. How in the world are they going to do all this? But they do it. And when, you know, Property Brothers, that's one of the shows that I've been forced to watch. And (laughs) these guys go in there, and it's like this house that is all chopped up into small rooms, and they, like, superimpose their blueprint onto it and say, we're going to knock all these walls out. And I'm just thinking to myself, I can't see it. And then you see it at the end, and you're just like, wow, that is really a cool house. Knocked all these walls out, wide open floor plan. What have they done? They've gone in and renovated because they were able to see the structure. They were able to see and know what their plans were and then execute it. You and I are limited. We're not experts, by the way, Yesterday, I fixed a doorknob in my house. It was a banner day. Like, I did it with a screwdriver. I, like, fixed this old doorknob, and I was so proud of myself. I invited Jane down. I said, Jane, come. I said, doorknob. I fixed it. And she's just like, you are amazing. She totally built me up. And it's like, you are amazing. I was like, yeah. I had my tool bag and the whole thing. Like, marched it down there. I... Listen, an expert's able to look and say, I can take this, I I know the structure, I can change the electrical, I can make something beautiful out of this mess. Can I tell you that God is the master craftsman of our lives? You and I sometimes look at our life and go, man, I got this wall and I got this messed up system and grid and I've got these experiences and my life is little. There's no way that things could change and improve in my life like that. And God says, If you'll trust me, I'm already looking at your life and I know exactly what I created you for. I know exactly how. If you'll let me rewire you, if you'll let me change your perspective, if you'll let me remove some walls, if you'll let me come in and renovate, I can take something that is a mess and that you might overlook and I can turn it into something powerful and beautiful. That's the art of renovation. That's what God wants to do in us. That's why renewing our minds is so significant and it's so necessary. So this morning, let me give you just four things that you need to know about renewal. This is going to help you because renewal is something you can know about but never do. And I don't want you to be knowers. I want you to be doers. Knowers don't, don't experience change. Knowers experience information. But doers begin to taste and see that the Lord is good. First thing you need to know about renewal is this, is that renewal within us comes before renewal through us. And God wants to bring renewal to the world through you. You are called in Jesus Christ to be an agent of change. That's who you are. You've been created in Christ Jesus to be the salt of the earth. 
to be the light of the world, to be leaven of the kingdom. But that can't happen until there has been a change that has taken place in you and then will actually change through you. Because as long as you and I are carrying around the same broken blueprint on the inside of us, we'll just, we, we reproduce on the outside of our lives everything that we believe on the inside of our lives. So for example, in, in my experience in my family, um, in, on, on the coming side especially, divorce was rampant. My dad was divorced three times. My uncle divorced three times. Then on my mother's side, there's massive amounts of divorce. And so Jane and I have been married almost 26 years now. And, and for 26 years, I, we got married very young. It, the, I began to see time-released mentalities and attitudes on the inside of me as a young husband that I never knew were there, but because of how I had grown up and what I had seen, I began to see, I, I, I never had a moment where I was like, Jane, I'm divorcing you, but I began to see the very symptoms and the things that actually led to dysfunction in my family's marriages that were being lived out in, on the inside of me, like, you know, walking away or getting angry or holding a grudge or, you, you know, I mean, those kind of things that were just there that when I looked at my family's life, whom I love dearly, I just saw these dysfunctions in their lives. I would have never said, hey, I learned from my family to do this and I put it into practice. It was just by default. So I had to change the way that I thought because my goal was this. I want to please God and I want to give an inheritance and a legacy to my kids. I want my kids to know that I love their mother for 65, 70 years like my, grand my grandparents did. And my grandparents are celebrating, I think, 67 years of marriage this year. Well, it's like, I want to skip a generation. I want that inheritance. I want that. You know what that requires, though? A change of mind. Because how many know your mind does crazy things when you, triggers get pushed? Does anybody have any triggers in this place? You could be loving Jesus. You could be driving down the road, listening to Corey C. Just the never-ending reckless. Love. And somebody cuts you off. And immediately, man, you, you wish you had a 50 caliber turret on the front of your car so that you could like go into Terminator mode. Cars rolling all over the road. That'll teach you. Back to my song. <laughs> Endless hallelujah. It's like, where did that come from? It's wiring. It's how you've been programmed. Little trivia question. You have to be honest, all right? Because you're in church. You can't lie. How many of you in raising your kids, if you have children, have ever heard yourself in a moment say something to, to your kids that sounded exactly like your parents? Raise your hand. You know where that comes from? Wiring programming, paradigms. God wants renewal within us so that there can actually be renewal through us. If God can change your way of thinking, he'll change your life. And when he changes your life, he'll change the world. Number two, salvation happens in a moment, but renewal occurs day by day. Salvation happens in a moment. And this is where we get hung up a lot of times. We look at our lives and we, we think to ourselves, well, if I'm really saved, then I should be different. This is where the identity issue is so important because a lot of times we just settle and we say, well, I, I gave my life to Jesus 10 years ago, but I, I still am struggling and I'm still seeing myself and I'm still kind of activating the same way I did before I was a Christian. So it must be that to be a Christian just means that my sins are forgiven, but nothing's really going to change till I go to heaven. But what we miss out is that salvation happens in a moment. Your spirit, you are a three-part person. You have a spirit. You are a spirit that lives in a body and you have a soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. When you get saved, your spirit gets saved. It is, it is shaped. It looks like Jesus. It is never going to be any more saved than it is on the moment that you receive Christ into your life and you are born again. But your mind, will, and emotions, your soul realm, requires a process of renewal and change. 
Because that's where you're struggling most of the time. Most of the issues in our life have nothing to do with spiritual issues. They have everything to do with soulish issues. Our mind, our will, our emotions, our attitudes. Who are we going to obey? Are we going to obey God by faith or are we going to pay attention to our desires, what we want, or our appetites, or our education, or the world's consensus? Because those things have a strong gravitational pull, don't they? It's like, well, I want to do that, so I'm just going to do it. Or that's what everybody else is doing, so that seems right. Or that's all I've ever known. That's how I was trained. Salvation happens in a moment, but renewal, or changing our thinking, is something that has to happen over a long period of time that requires day-by-day day change. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16 says, Therefore we do not lose... We, 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 rewind the tape. Okay. Would you just say it? Come on, man. All right, all right. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man, listen, is being renewed day by day. So our inward man is saved. You are saved to the bone. You can't get any more saved. If, if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, you are saved. But your thinking, your mind, your attitude, which Romans Chapter 6 says that your carnal mind, in other words, your fleshly mind, is unsaved. And now it needs to be brought into submission to God's word and God's ways and God's way of thinking. And the way that we do that is through renewal, and that happens day by day. It doesn't happen in a moment. I wish I could give you a USB you know, thing, you just boop. And all of a sudden, it just changes the programming, the, the way that you think, your attitude. I wish you just became a holy saint on day one. I wish you didn't struggle with your hangups, your fears, your insecurities, your limited thinking, your lack of faith. I wish that wasn't the case on day one. I wish it was just like osmosis. But it's not the way that it happens. Our carnal mind is at enmity or is hostile against the things of God. Carnal mind, fleshly, old you, old man, like we talked about last week, is opposed to the ways of God because it's infected by the Trojan horse of sin. The virus that has crept in through sin that has affected us and by our experiences that have created fears and by the, uh, the, the need for affirmation and approval by the consensus of people that are around us. So how do we do that day by day? Well, the way that we do that day by day is the way we do anything day by day. If you can't change your attitude in a moment, then what do you have to do? It's day by day by day by day. You are not the result of what you do in one day. You are the result of what you do every day. How many know, you know, at the beginning of the year, everybody signs up for the gym? And so if you go to the gym on January 20th, I mean, it is the busiest day out of the year. It's like everybody's, are, you know, they're on the bench press, they're pumping, they're on this machine, they're going over here, treadmill, and their dumbbell, oh, put that one down, it's a little too heavy, go over here, do this one. They're getting their drinking fountain, they got their earphones in, their new workout outfit, their gear that they got for Christmas, and they're just walking around doing their thing. But come back a month later, and 50% of all those people are gone. And then people wonder, well, how does that guy who's at the gym, you know, who's got the shoulders way out to here and he, you know, he's got the, the ripped six pack abs and he's walking around and he's got his routine. We, we show up on January 2nd, we look at that guy and go, well, how come I'm not looking like that? I'm here at the gym. But the difference is he got there, not by what he did in a day, he got there Number one, because he won the genetic lottery. But number two, because, because he's there day after day after day after day after day after day. You want to know how you look like this? You go to five guys day after day after day after day after day. That's what you do. And you too. Can... 
It's what we, we are the result of what we do day after day after day after day. That's how renewal works. It works in the faith positive and it also works in the sin negative. We reinforce over and over certain patterns. When you walk on an area of your lawn, in order to a shortcut across your lawn, you walk across that enough times back and forth and eventually what begins to form? A pathway. And the grass refuses to grow there because now it's a path. You've walked over it so many times. We have pathways in our life that have been created by repetition. It's like, this is what I do. When this person does this, this is what I do. It's my shortcut to get what I want, which is the pain to go away, the fear to go away, or the result that I want. We create pathways. What renewal is is changing our pathways. And it happens by day after day renewal. Number three, Renewal of our minds is actually a spiritual metamorphosis. It, there is a natural process of metamorphosis where things change and transform. We see it in the, in the plant world. We see it in the animal world, like a, a caterpillar that goes into a, um, a, a chrysalis and then comes out a butterfly. It's transformation. It's, it's a metamorphosis. It literally means to change. Renewal of our minds, changing the way that we think, is actually a spiritual metamorphosis. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to James chapter 1. Hopefully you brought a Bible. It's going to come up on the screens if you didn't, but I strongly encourage you when you come, bring a Bible. I want you to see it, underline it, and it will help you actually renew your minds. So James chapter 1. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation this morning. It says in verse 21, It says, so get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word of God that has been planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your souls. Now read on. It says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and you don't obey, It's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless what you are doing. So it says, it starts off the New King James, which I memorized scripture as a young man, says this. It says, therefore... Receive with meekness or humility the implanted word of God, which is able, listen, to save your souls. This isn't talking about salvation. Your spirit is saved when you're born again. James is writing to Christians. They're already saved. See, after you get saved and receive eternal life, now God wants your mind to get saved through the process of renewal because it will actually save, change your way of living and your way of thinking. And then it goes on and it talks about being doers of the word and not just hearers only. And it, and it illustrates for us what it is, what reading the word of God really does for us. So I've got two mirrors up here. Here's what happens. The Bible says that when you and I spend time in God's word, which by the way, listen, God says about his word that his word is actually like a seed. And if you know anything about a seed, a seed is a capsule that contains DNA genetic code that once it is sown into the right soil, the the blueprint, the chromosomal information on the inside of the seed gets released and it actually produces what it was coded to do, right? Right? So you got a a kernel of corn that has been genetically modified so that it can resist weeds, grow in different temperatures. It has been engineered. It's like a, a, a math equation on the inside of it. That corn will never grow until it is received into the soil. So you can walk around with a kernel of, of, of corn in your hand, or you can plant it and it will multiply and reproduce more of what's on the inside of it. God says the word of God is a seed. And we can either carry around the word and never get it in here. A lot of us are carrying around a kernel of corn going, look, I got this corn. And what we're doing is I'm carrying around God's word. 
But what God is more concerned about is that he gets his word into your heart. Because if it gets into your heart, it begins to reproduce everything that it's coded. And how God's word is coded is with life, it's with freedom, it's with healing, it's with deliverance, it's with identity. It says that you are saved, you've been brought out of darkness into light, that your sins have been removed from you as far as the east is from the west. It says in Jeremiah chapter 1 that before you breathed your first breath or were in your mother's womb, God knew you and called you. It says that he's intricately wired you. It says that you are his workmanship, that he has a purpose and a destiny for your life. It it gives us instruction of how to look like Jesus, how to act like Jesus, how to have a life that is blessed and walking in step with God's purposes for our life. But if all we ever do is carry around the seed in our hand and it never gets into our heart, it never changes us. So every time we go to God's word and we, with humility, which means, God, you're right, I'm wrong all the time. Can we just settle that issue, by the way? God's right, we're wrong. If we disagree with this, it's not God that needs to change, it's us that needs to change. And the church would do really well if in 2018 we finally come to grips with the fact as sophisticated and as educated as we are, we are not smart enough to tell God he needs to change. We need to humble ourselves and repent and change according to God's word. We do so well to believe that. But it says it's like a mirror. When we come to God's word and we look into it, it reflects back to us who we are. And we see it. Because it's not obvious to us in the natural. When we look into God's word, we begin to realize, I am blessed. Look at that. I'm blessed. As I read the scriptures in Psalm chapter 1, it says, blessed is the man. When I look into God's word, I realize there's mercy When I look into God's word, I realize how I deal with situations that are broken in my relationships is through grace, forgiveness, confrontation, turning the other cheek, loving our enemies. And I realize that. And so I realize that my identity is in Christ, that I'm no longer seen by God as a vagabond wanderer. I look into them and he sees me as a son. Every time I go to the Word, that's what I see. It's accurate. It's truthful. How many wake up every morning and look in the mirror? How many looked in the mirror before you came to church today? Come on, everybody in this room. Don't lie to me. You're all like brushing your teeth and combing your hair or whatever, you, you know, ladies putting the makeup on. You're staring into the mirror. Why? So that when you leave home, you don't look weird. Because you know who you are, listen, you know who you are and you know who you are at your best, but you know that life happens. And so before you leave, what do you do? You look in the mirror and you make adjustments because things get out of sort. Your hair gets all like tilty. You got mascara running down your face because ladies, you didn't want to wash your face before going to bed last night. You got like a little blemish here. You shave. You don't want like patches of whiskers all over the place. And so you make adjustments Because this is true. So you come to this and mirrors don't lie. So you look into this mirror and you make adjustments. Now here's what happens to most of us. Most of us, the only mirror before coming to Jesus, before being given God's word, the only mirror that we have is a distorted mirror. It's the mirror of the world. It's a mirror that has been, it's a reflection of an image that is not true, it is deceptive. And so we've grown up all of our lives coming and looking in the mirror of the world. I look like a meerkat. I got like two inch long legs and an eight foot torso. And I'm looking at that. If all my life this is the only mirror I've ever looked at, then I'm gonna live my life walking around thinking this is who I am. This is who I am. I keep coming back to it year after year. It's like, okay, there I am. That's all I've ever seen. But this is perverted, distorted, and twisted. What if we've lived our whole life looking in this mirror, looking looking at ourselves through the lens of the world, our dysfunction, our brokenness, what other people have told us about us, our worst fears, and this is who we think we are. But in Jesus, he says to us, and by the way, there are a lot of church-going, God-loving Christians who still live their lives loving Jesus but coming back to this mirror. 
And that's why they say, well, this is just who I am. This is just how I am. I can't change because every time I come back to the mirror, this is what I see. But God says, shift gears, come over to my mirror. And for the first time, we see ourselves as we really are in Christ. And it's shocking. It's like, whoa, this is not what I'm used to. This is not what I've been told. This is not what I believed. It says, lest we look in the mirror, see ourselves, and walk away and forget who we are. You want to know how you renew your mind? You renew your mind by building a database daily in your life of God's word, allowing the Holy Spirit who's in you to speak to you every time you go to the very words that he inspired to be written in our Bibles. When you go here and you read the Bible day after day after day after day after day, what you are doing is you are building a database that eclipses and supersedes the former database that the world put on the inside of you. Because the world does. You think about how many hours of television, how many songs, how many movies, how many experiences, how many hours in school, how many uh, experiences of being bullied, how many times sitting around the dinner table, how many times the enemy has whispered and brought fears and deceptions and distortions and lies in our life. Accumulate those hours upon hours and experiences upon experiences. And is it any wonder that by the time we get to adulthood, we're messed up, we're staring in this mirror. And we think this, this is true. But then we come into, into Christ because we hear the good news and we say, yeah, I want that. I want to live like Jesus. I want to be victorious. I want to be a child of God. And we get saved on the inside, but our mind still goes back to that mirror. And Jesus is like, switch mirrors. Change mirrors. Oh, I can't go to that mirror. It's too hard. I don't like to read. Then get it on tape. Or, I mean, <laughs> or download you version and let it read to you. But get it. Read it in Braille. I don't care what you got to do. Hire somebody to read the Word of God to you. But get a hunger for the Word of God because we need a daily database of this. Because when you take this in and you read it and you meditate and you think about it, what happens is day by day by day, you begin to experience change in your thinking and your perspective. Every situation and temptation you find yourselves in, instead of thinking to the old way, the Holy Spirit brings up and says, remember what the Word says, and oh yeah, that's right, I'm not supposed to cut this guy off on the highway and throw him down into the ditch. I should turn the other cheek, which in this means switch lanes. Okay, wow, it's amazing. We would have less road rage and as Christians in jail, you would be living a much happier life. <laughs> Number four, to the degree that your thinking is renewed in an area of your life is the measure of how much of God's perfect will and purpose you're able to walk in. So think about an area of your life, family, finances, career, sexuality, children, think about how you handle your money, think about friendship, all these different areas of your life. God's word speaks to every one of those areas of our life. And when we begin to be renewed in all those areas, to the degree that we've received we, uh, with meekness God's word, and it's changed our way of thinking, is the degree that we're able to walk in the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will and purpose of God for our lives. So if you struggle with an addiction, well, you know, this is, this is who I am. No, the Bible says in Christ you are a new creation. You are not defined by your temptation or your hang-up. That's not your identity. You may struggle with that, but that's not who you are. You're a child of God. When my kids come into the house, I don't care what kind of mess that they're going through, that's not who they are. They bear the name Cummings. They are my son. They are my daughter. And I love them, and I will go to bat for them. I just want them to overcome it. You are not the sum total of your temptations, whatever they are, your hangups. You are not that. You were created in Christ Jesus for good works, not for bad works. But in order for us to walk in the good works, we have to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. I want everybody, if you would, stand up with me. Worship team, you guys can come on out. Switch mirrors. That's the invitation this morning, is that you would make the decision to switch mirrors and to let God renew you in your thinking. Change the way that you 
see yourselves, see other people. You know, there's this story in the book of Numbers about the children of Israel about ready to go into the promised land. And you might remember the story. Joshua sends the spies, 12 spies into the land. When they came back, they had seen giants in the land. They came back and 10 of them gave a negative report. Here was their report. There's giants in the land, and when we saw them, we were as grasshoppers in our own sight, and so were we in theirs. Did you catch that? We were like grasshoppers in comparison to them in our own sight, and so were we in theirs. There were only two of the spies, Caleb and Joshua, that eventually went into the promised land because they were the only two that said, we are more than able to go in and conquer them. Let us go up at once and take the land. The Bible says that there was a more excellent spirit in them, a different spirit. One was a fear-based, distorted mirror that said, I'm just a grasshopper. These guys are just gonna squash me. And the other mentality said, you know what, they may be taller than us, but they're nothing in, compared, in comparison to the size of our God. And if God says he's with us, if God has told us that that land belongs to us, what are we waiting for? Let's go up right now and let's take what's ours. Those guys, man, they are, we're gonna eat them for breakfast because God is with us. In your life, there's a promised land, there's an inheritance. But if you see yourself as a grasshopper, You'll never go in and possess it. We need to change the way that we see ourselves, not because we're, we convince ourselves that we're something that we're not, but we allow God to convince us of who we are in him. And that's my prayer for us this morning. Would you bow your heads with me all over this room? Today, without anyone looking around, I wanna ask you a question, and this is a very important question. The question is this, what is the Holy Spirit today highlighting in your life? What area is he saying to you, I wanna change the way that you see this. I, I want you to change. I, I want there to be change transformation in your life so that you can step into this. If there's an area, if there's something that today you sense that the Holy Spirit is highlighting, as I've been speaking, God's been speaking. And if there's something the Holy Spirit's been highlighting in your life, I just want you to raise your hand all over this room. Just something that you specifically just feel for you. And put your hands down. Today, maybe you haven't felt a, a prompting or felt anything, but as I've been talking, there's an area in your life or a challenge that stands before you where you're saying, God, I want your help. I want to change. I don't want to be like I've been. I want to change. I want to, I want to obey you. I want to serve you in this area. Help me. If that's you, you just raise your hand all over the room. Thank you. Thank you. I want to invite our prayer partners, if they would, make their way down to the front. And please remain in an attitude of prayer because I'm going to pray a prayer over us. And then when we dismiss here in a moment, here's what I'm going to do. If you raised your hands, or maybe you know that you needed to, I'm gonna ask that if you really, if you really wanna see today become a, a, a demarcation of change, transformation, I'm gonna ask you to do two things. Number one, I'm gonna ask you in your heart to go ahead and make a commitment and say, God, today I make the commitment that I'm gonna, I'm gonna pursue you. I'm gonna pursue your word. I'm gonna pursue kingdom understanding. I'm not going to look in the old mirror any longer. I'm going to begin to come back and live constantly in your word until my mind and my thinking is changed in this. With the help of your Holy Spirit, I will be different. That's first commitment. The second commitment is this. Is I'm just going to invite you if, you, if you would like, when I pray and dismiss in a moment, that you just come, come down and receive prayer ministry down here in the front by our prayer team. Because Sometimes we just need a tipping point breakthrough. We just need a prayer. We just need to take a step out of our normal and ask for help or, 
or do something that's out of our comfort zone that begins to just kind of break the ice and open up the ground for the seed to be received into our lives. There is power in change that happens in prayer. It's, it's, it's the beginning stage. It's like the plow going into the soil, breaking up the fallow ground so that the word can come behind it and be received. Lord, today I pray for each of us that change and renewal would begin today. Lord, that we would, we would begin to see roots and shoots that lead to fruit coming out of our lives because the seed of your word is deeply planted in us. Lord, we wanna walk in our full identity as saints, sons, and daughters. Lord, help us to do that. Holy Spirit, meet us in this place. And as we leave today, pray, Lord, that we would be agents of change because change has come to us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.